Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please feel free to ask questions as I go along. Um, but I will allow a period at the end as well. So make sure you have a couple of questions to ask me at the end. Otherwise, it's a bit awkward for everyone. So make sure, think about a couple of questions while I'm going through. But you're welcome to interrupt me. If, if I'm going to cover it later on, I'll just sort of let you know and we might just move on quickly. But if it's something that I think it's important to address, then we'll make sure we cover it well. Do you want to have an intermediate? Or, uh, yeah, we'll. we'll um, I've got it organised. We'll go for about 40 minutes and then take about 10 minutes break if all goes to plan, and then um, get into the second half. The, the, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Can you get me uh, kick started here, Ivan? Thank you, Ivan. Oh, thank you. So uh, the two lectures will be on the evolution of high efficiency silicon solar cell designs and I'm fortunate enough to have been in, involved in one way or another with a lot of that evolution and a lot of it happened within about 30 metres of this room here. So just uh, down the corridor here in the LEC engineering building was a lot of where the uh, cell development I'll be talking about actually occurred. Um, I'm director of this um, newly established, it's about a year old, Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, which is based here at UNSW but involves other universities around Australia that are interested in PV research, such as ANU and Melbourne, Monash, a few others like that. Um, so let's get on with it. So this is the outline of the lecture, this is the first one. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of things that have happened since I gave the lecture last year. Not that any of you are probably here, although I noticed Chi Mun is back. <laughs> um, so you'll hear some fresh stuff, Chi Mun. Um, and then a little bit of the early history, talk a little bit about peer junction space cells, give a couple of um, what I think are the key issues with PN junctions, and then um, just give it a, 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 the early parts of the modern era, how we got into that one there, and then we'll take a break and uh, with time for questions before then. So um, recent developments, this is just a chart I've been preparing for many years now, but each year I just update the amount of new capacity that's been added from various sources. So I started in about 2005, I think, when PV is the yellow one was way down here. Um, but it, PV has sort of surged from nowhere over the last decade or so. Uh, wind for long was the largest source of new electricity generation, um, renewable at least, that was installed worldwide. But last year was a historic year in that P, there's more PV capacity installed worldwide than wind for the first time. And I think that'll be the situation from now on well into the future. So um, historically, um, you know, there's been a turning point. There was another turning point I got very excited back in 2006 when photovoltaics overtook nuclear for the first time, but as you can see there's a lot more photovoltaics going into nuclear despite the much bigger press nuclear seems to get. Uh, in fact last year photovoltaics was the second biggest source of new electricity generation capacity, only coal was bigger. So another, another sort of historic moment. Um, some of us involved in photovoltaics, as long as I have, um, you know, I've always knew it was going to be big, but that um, perception is now becoming more per pervasive. And uh, Bloomberg uh, last year published this chart here, just carrying on my chart into the future, looking at gigawatts of new capacity installed over the coming decade or two, and photovoltaics of different types of the two yellow bits there. 
So, um, you know, and this is uh, coal here. So, you know, last year coal was still well ahead of photovoltaics, but over the next 10 or 20 years, um, market ob observers like Bloomberg are expecting that photovoltaics will overtake the fossil fuels as a major source of new electricity generation. So studying photovoltaics mightn't be too bad an idea. It's going to be a big industry in the future. So already it's um, done a lot better relative to wind than was projected just a year ago. Uh, that's not where it's going to stop. This is a, a study that was conducted by the German Advisory Council on Global Change. It was really conducted early in the turn of the century. Um, but this is one of the most optimistic forecasts that's been made for the role that solar electricity in particular can pay, play in the future energy supply for the world. So uh, here we are now in 2014. Most of our, prim this is primary energy up here, exajoules per annum. But um, at this stage here, we're mostly dominated by the fossil fuels, gas, coal and oil. But um, this group was charged with finding a transition scenario that would take us from that dependence to something more sustainable. And this is what they came up with, sort of increasing uh, reliance on the renewables, biomass, wind and solar to take up the solar electricity, to take up the increasing demand and finally driving down the dependence upon fossil fuels. So by the end of the century, we were mainly dependent upon solar energy, 64% of our primary energy, not just electricity from solar, 25% from by mid-century. So that's obviously a very um, ambitious scenario for a role of a new energy source. But if we look at what's actually been happening, I've got this thing here. This is the um, same type of information plotted on a logarithmic plot. So this is installed, new installed capacity gigawatts logarithmic, uh, on a logarithmic scale. Um, and the yellow, red lines show the figures that were used in that study. So they had, um, you know, to get to this 25% of um, photovoltaics in, pri in primary energy supply, not just electricity, by 2050, this is the trajectory that they assumed in that study. And for wind, a similar type of trajectory, uh, peaking over because of the lower fundamental abundance of wind compared to solar. And nuclear, this being a German study, they weren't particularly ambitious about the role, optimistic about the role nuclear would play, but they saw it peaking sometime around 2030, then slowly declining. Um, and the green things show what's actually been happening. Again, this is a chart I've been filling in every year. It's been interesting to watch the dots grow, but um, wind sticking pretty much to plot. So it's growing at pretty much the rate that was projected in that study. So growing 10 times over a decade was the rate that was projected there as being a constraint on what could be sustained over long periods. Uh, nuclear has not fared as well for various reasons that you're probably aware of. Um, so it's actually been, there was less energy generated from nuclear last year than at the turn of the century. Um, but PV has been the one that's uh, outstripped even this very ambitious scenario. So the last um, decade in particular just streaked ahead of the field and um, now getting to the stage where it's reach, about to reach its first milestone, which is supplying 1% of the world's electricity. But if it can keep to the left of this line here, it, um, it may be able to supply 20% of, 25% of the world's primary energy by this time scale. So already at the um, end of last year, 2013, we'd already reached the levels in this study that pro were projected for 2020. So we're sort of a seven years ahead of that quite ambitious German scenario. So who knows, we may actually get to the 25% of primary energy before then. Things can happen quickly once everyone agrees that that's the way to go. Okay, well that's a little bit of background. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the PV, early PV history, and this is going right back to the very early days. So this is the first device that's regarded, I guess a photoelectric generator you might call it, but this is Edmund Becquerel, um, looks quite a stately gentleman there, but he was only 19 when he actually did this experiment, so quite a youngster. Um, but he, he was fiddling around with this type of configuration here with metal electrodes in liquid solutions, and he noticed that when he shone light on it, he could get electricity from it. So this is regarded as the first sort of photovoltaic demonstration, you know, electricity from, from light. He actually used that in a lot of his subsequent experiments, so he found a, a use for it. Uh, even though obviously not very practical. 
The next big step forward was going from something liquid to something solid state. And um, this is William Adams, who, um, uh, together with one of his students, uh, Richard Day, um, they were investigating the properties of selenium. It, it was a, it'd been identified a few years before that when you shone light on selenium, its resistance changed, which was an interesting effect, which um, you know has been subsequently used in a lot of applications. But um, they got interested in, in seeing whether by shining light on the material, they could actually make electricity flow. And they conducted the experiment, and sure enough, they got electrical flow out of it. So that was really the first solid state um, um, photovoltaic demonstration. This is a drawing that I, I drew from their original paper, but surprisingly, just last year, one of my colleagues actually photographed some of these ones in a British museum. I forget which one, but maybe the Victoria and Albert Museum hidden away in their stocks. But these are little glass vials with the uh, selenium rods in them. This was, these are actually samples, and it turns out these were the ones used in the experiment, but Willoughby Smith had prepared them a few years earlier for doing photoconductivity measurements, and they just borrowed them from him to, um, to investigate the photovoltaics. So interesting bit of history there. But the guy that probably started, really started it all um, was um, uh, Edgar Fritz, who in 1983 demonstrated this device here. So he managed to press out a bit of selenium onto a copper plate, or a brass plate, and then he put a very thin beaten gold leaf over the top to let the light through, and he was able to demonstrate photovoltaic effect there. Um, and he, he, he saw everything. So, you know, remembering back then, 1883, like the reticulated electricity supplies weren't really available, but, you know, he saw it all. You know, current, if not wanted immediately, can either be stored, were produced in storage battery, or transmitted to distance, and they're used or stored. So, quite a visionary. He was really an inventor. Like, he, you know, he was interested in everything, not just photovoltaics. He got quite a few patents to his name, but apparently the patent he filed on this device didn't get up. Now, this is a drawing from his patent application. I haven't been able to find it, but someone else has. But this is um, his devices. And surprisingly, again, this is a photograph I know you came across last year, but he actually built a working system. Well, I guess it worked. This is in New York in 1884. So he's got these solar panels here that are all powered by these selenium devices. So, um, yeah, so that, you know, they're real photovoltaic panels. So the history goes back quite a long way, 130 years of actual solid state photovoltaic. Unfortunately, the selenium devices weren't all that efficient, like a lot less than 1% efficient, so it wasn't really very practical, but still very interesting. And, and um, you know, Edgar Fritz was a real visionary in just sort of seeing where things might lead. The next big development was um, cuprous oxide. If you oxidise copper, and one of my students did a thesis on it one year, and we just used a blowtorch to oxidise the copper to get this cuprous oxide on the surface and then you press a metal against it and you can get a photovoltaic action from that device. So that's, um, I've heard the term used, you know, you can make a photovoltaic device by spinning on a penny, but making an efficient one is the challenge. So <laughs> that's probably where that saying comes from, spinning on a penny, you can get some type of photovoltaic action. And a lot of the prestigious journals like Nature and so on, they don't publish stuff on silicon devices because that's too boring an old hat, but it's spitting on a penny type papers that they tend to publish, ones that no one's got an idea of what's going on, but you get an interesting effect from it. So I often regard the, you know, the papers that you see on photovoltaics in the highly ranked journals are what I call spitting on penny type papers. And then the structures were more or less refined and, and during the 30s was when the understanding of what was going on uh, started to develop. Like with the a, with a selenium work, um, you know, they thought the selenium might have been crystallising by the light or something like that. They didn't really have the basic tools for understanding the photo excitation of electrons and all that kind of thing. So they're just thinking of this physical effect, crystallisation of the material, which can happen and given an electrical output, so it's not all that silly, but that was the way they tried to explain what they were observing. Um, so this was a guy, um, Alan Wilson, I, I think his name is, um, who, um, who published the first real semiconductor theory description of what was happening in these semiconductor materials. Um, so this was published in 1931. And uh, when you read the paper, it reads pretty much like a textbook, you know, like a modern textbook talking about, you know, periodic potentials and the way the bands split at the 
edges of the peri periodic um, uh, zone and so on. But that was a big boost forward in understanding, you know, bands of allowed states and unallowed states so allowed the difference between metals and insulators and semiconductors to be, you know, understood scientifically for the first time. And then that triggered understanding of how the devices were working. So that was a very important step first forward, just getting a basic concepts about what was happening in these materials correct. And uh, this is Walter Schottke. I had the honour of giving the Walter Schottke lecture a few years ago, so I did a bit of research on him. But he, he um, actually tried to understand how the devices worked. So rather than the, just the semiconductors, what was happening at the interfaces and so on that, that made the um, cells active. So he's, his name lives on in the Schottky barrier, which is a rectifying metal to semiconductor contact, which can be used in uh, photovoltaics, has been used in photovoltaics. A lot of the organic photovoltaic devices use those types of contacts. So um, yeah, Sch Schottky's work was quite important in that he got, he, he propagated this idea of the interface between different materials having barriers at them and things like that. And that sort of um, made everyone's mind receptive to interpreting the, the next big thing that happened, which was the discovery of the PN junction. And uh, this happened ser serendipitously. This is uh, Russell Ohl. And in 1941, he was working with a process that's widely used in photovoltaics today, but just directionally solidifying silicon in a, in a crucible like this. So you, you put solid silicon in there, then you melt it, then you slowly cool, generally from the bottom, and the molten silicon just solidifies from the bottom up. And um, he was working with very pure silicon because he, he, he was interested in, they used to put little pointy bits of metal onto the surface of silicon to make high frequency diodes. So a very important part of radar during the, the war years, during the Second World War. Um, so, you know, he was really interested in that. But, but when he um, was investigating this material, he, he noticed that there were two different types of silicon that he produced. And if he shone a light on the material, one bit would become positive and the other bit would become negative potential. So um, he called one region the P region, positive region. And guess what? That was the region that became positive. That was the P type region. And then negative was the N type region. So you shouldn't have any trouble figuring out what polarity, what part of a PN junction becomes when you shine light on it. <laughs> it was, was named after that effect. So really photovoltaics was, um, you know, underpinned the discovery of the PN junction. But what was happening was that as this silicon was solidifying, boron and phosphorus were, atoms were getting incorporated into the, um, into the solidifying silicon. But um, the, the phosphorus sort of less, less able to be incorporated. So it, uh, it gets, oh, sorry, no, I got the other way wrong, around. Um, yeah, or, or maybe, um, no, no, that's right, yeah. So as, as you, um, as you uh, solidify the material, the phosphorus gets incorporated in the material and becomes weaker in the regions that solidify last, but the effect with boron is less pronounced. So it's more uniformly distributed through the material. So you end up a region here that has more phosphorus in it than boron and a region here that has more boron in it than phosphorus. So you get a natural PN junction occurring in this material. Of course, you know, they didn't understand all this when they first discovered it. It was just that something interesting was happening. And because of the work of Schottky with barriers and so on, they said, oh, well, they got two different types of material and there's a barrier at the interface. So hence the PN junction was, was born. So, um, you know, if, you, if you've got a block like this with a natural PN junction in it, you can cut it to, um, you know, make a, make a device with the PN junction incorporated in it rather than using the whole block. And you can actually make solar cells from, from those PN junctions. And that's what they did back in 1941. So this is, um, this is like an IV curve. This is really suns up in this direction. And this is voltage and a whole lot of other things here. But this is this essentially the sun's VOC curve, as it's known as today, the output voltage of the device as you increase the illumination. So it's giving about 0.3 of a volt's output, whereas a, you know, a good silicon cell these days will give you 0.6 or 0.7. So, but still, you know, not bad for material that was just formed by serendipity. Um, you know, so quite respectable um, PN junction devices. So this is just the current sort of 
increase, increasing more or less linearly with the lumens, and this is probably the ratio of the two sort of going down as the voltage saturates. So that, um, you know, that, so that was the first actual measurement. I figured it was a lot less than 1% efficient though, despite you know, having reasonable current voltage characteristics, but still um, a working device. Um, but the discovery of the PN junction you know, triggered you know, the understanding of doping of semiconductors and so on, you know, the P-type material and what, what's causing it to have P-type materials. And the theory of the PN junction um, progressed very rapidly as too uh, at that time. So this is William Shockley who got a Nobel Prize for essentially working out the theory of PN junctions and inventing some devices that used it, namely the bipolar junction transistor that's shown in his drawing there, two PN junctions back to back. Um, but he developed the theory, and again, if you read his theory of PN junction, it's pretty much like reading a modern textbook, even though it was done in 1949. Um, so that led to the first cells. So, the, so this, was the, this was the one that um, Russell Ohl first made, just put a metal contact on the N-type side and a little ring contact onto the P-type side shown there. And he said, oh, this isn't a really great way of making a PN junction. How else can I do that? So he hit upon the idea of iron implantation. So he bombarded with helium. I'm not quite, quite sure why he chose helium, but it had the desired result of forming a PN junction. If he had a tried phosphorus or something, he may have even got better devices. But this device actually probably hit the 1% efficiency mark because of the junctions were more controlled than in this device here. So this was 1951 he made this structure. So uh, Russell played a, a big part in the early history, like discovering the PN junction and, and um, I guess developing cell design as well, as indicated in that slide. Um, this is the, the first silicon cells you generally hear are discovered by Bell Labs in 1954. So this is the work that's referred to there. It was really the first efficient devices, like the rest were struggling to get 1% you know, or so efficiency. But these very quickly got up to four and then six and then 10% efficiency. They were based on these, you might just be able to pick them up there, I'm not sure, but these are little semicircular wafers that you can see encapsulated there and there's a few scattered around the, the bench. So they sliced the wafer in half and then they diffused, um, um, oh, I guess it was P-type impurity. I think they might have used indium initially, something that was easy to um, work with, but formed a um, junction between right around the skin and then somehow got rid of it in this region here to form a positive and a negative uh, contact. So it was really a rear contact cell, the early, um, the first efficient silicon solar cells. So I guess you'd call it a, um, a meta wrap through cell in present technology, which we'll talk a little bit about in the second lecture. Um, so that was the first efficient device and that raised, that created a lot of attention so it actually made the first page in the New York Times, not as the main headline, but a little piece, <laughs> little piece down there. So it's really a nice little caption. Vast power of sun is tapped by battery using sand ingredient. So that was the, um, that was the first reporting of it. I forget what date it was, but it, it's, I think it was April um, 1954. And Bell Labs started um, you know, investigating what they could do with them. They made these little modules and so on. Um, very quickly soon after. So it caused a fair bit of excitement because this was the first sunlight converter that was able to demonstrate you know, practical types of efficiency. Um, you know, Bell Labs proposed a lot of applications, but the cells were too difficult to make, too expensive at that time to be used in anything but a very specialised application, and that was space cells. And, um, by 1958, the first cells were being used uh, in space. So um, the technology, this is a, I must be missing a slide, but this is a chart showing how the efficiency involved with time. So 1941, we had device less than 1%, about 1% in 1950, jumped quickly to four, to six, to eight, to 11. So a very rapid progress here. And um, then people realized that having the front so, contacts on the front made the cells easier to design and that gave another jump in efficiency. So by um, you know, the end of the 50s, you were dealing with a structure that looked pretty much like this with efficiencies about um, you know, 12 or 13%. So a very rapid evolution there. Um, 
But these devices, the reason that there was a lot of interest in developing these devices was this was the era of the space races and satellites and all this kind of thing. So a lot of um, countries' prestige was tied up in technology development. So um, the space race sort of um, resulted in the first serious applications of the cells. So the first use on a spacecraft was in 1958 on a US satellite Vanguard 1. And uh, yeah, you can see the little panels on the side there. So, um, you know, quite a tiny satellite, like it's, you know, what is it, 20, 30 centimetres across, so quite a tiny little thing. Um, and the space cells started taking this very standard form. They were two centimetres by two centimetres, and they had six fingers like this. And, and this was the standard design that was used for more than a decade. So people in space have to be very conservative. You don't want to try anything too new or you might wreck your whole mission. So the performance wasn't the important thing. It was the um, stability of the performance, the repeatability of good performing devices. So this conventional space cell was used first on these satellites and then almost immediately on just about every satellite that went up after that. There's actually a good story with this in that it powered a little tr radio transmitter in the satellite and they forgot to put an off button there. So the satellite just kept beeping away, you know, clogging up communication space for, I think, about six or seven years. Just so in space, you get damaging radiation, so the cells don't last forever. Otherwise, we'd still have problems with the satellite, but it, the cells eventually got killed by the radiation damage in space and the satellite stopped beeping to the relief of those involved in that type of thing. Um, but this is the cell design, so just a, a boron dope P-type region, a phosphorus N-type region, um, a metal contact to the rear, um, and um, metal contacts, metal fingal contacts to the front, and a rudimentary anti-reflection coating on the top surface. We'll talk a little bit about some of the deficiencies in that design as we go on. So now I'm trying to give you a few insights into what are important, to, what are important about PN junctions. I'm getting through this fairly quickly. Um, and again, you know, uh, William Shockley, Shockley. <laughs> we have got Walter Shockley and William Shockley. Um, but William was the one that developed the PN junction theater. Walter developed the metal interface theory. Um, so, um, so William was able to, he didn't actually, he wasn't the first to derive the characteristics of a solar cell, but uh, his theory was very important in allowing that to be done. But he derived the characteristics of a, a dark PN junction. So um, worked out the, the um, semiconductor parameters that were important in determining the dark curve. And then under illumination, the, the curve is just shifted down to the fourth quadrant, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, the way I like to think about it is to just imagine two bits of isolated material, like a P-type material here. You um, manipulate the concentration of positive carriers, and it turns out if you um, have got the device in equilibrium, that means a device sitting in a room like this in the dark though, um, no electrical excitation or anything, it turns out that the NP product has to have a constant value equal to, called the intrinsic carrier concentration squared. It's, one of, it's a mass action law that applies to the um, semiconductor material. So if you add boron atoms or whatever to um, increase the number of holes in a material, you'll have a high concentration of holes. This is concentration up here. And um, because the product has to equal this Ni squared, you'll have a low concentration of electrons. So that's, looks, that's the electron hole concentration in these two materials. If you have n-type material, you get the opposite occurring, high concentration of electrons, small holes. You put them together, something's got to happen. So um, you, know, you could figure out that far enough away from the interface, things would look pretty much the same as in bulk materials. So somehow in the interface, you have to have a transition between the concentrations. So you have a transition region between the two. So that's um, you know, just a consequence of very simple arguments. You can come to that conclusion. Um, uh, Shockley and others an analysed the properties of this region and were able to uh, very quickly derive expressions for the fields and so on that would be associated with it and the way these concentrations would change with distance within that region. Um, when you uh, excite the semiconductor theory, 
semiconductor material or excite a PN junction, you're able to manipulate those carrier concentrations. So um, essentially, let's see, yes, I've got those little arrows. Um, if you apply a voltage across a PN junction, you know, just thinking of the device in the dark, you can manipulate in particular the minority carrier concentrations at the edges of the depletion region. So um, the, um, the voltage acts like a, a, a concentration control button. You can um, dial up whatever value you want at the edges of these regions by dialing up the appropriate voltage across the junction. It turns out whatever happens to these, something similar happens to the, the majority carriers, the carriers that are there in their heavier concentration. So they have exactly the same distribution. But if you plot it on a logarithmic plot, this is supposed to be a linear plot with a break through the middle. But if you plot it on a logarithmic plot, you get the, you know, a more accurate conceptual picture, I guess. You know, apply a voltage across the junction, nothing much happens to the majority carriers because nothing much happens in relative terms but um, big things happen to the minority carriers. So voltage is like a minority carrier control knob um, within the, the PN junction. Um, the concentrations die down away from the junction as indicated um, here. Um, just high concentration here, that um, means that um, because of the gradients involved, electrons have to flow in this direction, and then as they flow through the material, you start to lose them they can't stay excited forever, and you get this um, exponential decay of carriers. When you uh, illuminate the device, you get a different feature. So this is meant to be uh, illuminated with red light, long wavelength light. You tend to get a uniform absorption of the red light through the material because it's weakly absorbed. So you tend to get a uniform generation of carriers throughout the material. So again, when you apply a voltage to the junction, the same thing still applies. You can control these concentrations at the edge of the depletion region by the voltage. So that's, you know, that's the main thing that the voltage does, dial up these concentrations. So if you um, put zero voltage across there, for example, you can force the electrons to have the same concentrations that they had with no voltage there, but the photo generation of the carriers is increasing the carrier concentrations in other regions. So again, well away from the junction, you'd expect the, the light to create some type of uniform excitation of photo-generated carriers, but because you can manipulate this value here by voltage, you can control the gradient of the um, carriers as they come into the junction. So that's the, the illuminated um, characteristics. And you know, from those arguments, you can um, work out the whole IV curve as Shockley first showed. So um, the dark characteristics, you're just manipulating the, the, the voltages, but um, when you, you, you can manip manipulate the concentration, hence the current flows by the voltages. So um, going, in, going in the forward direction, the forward voltage, you can get these concentrations up to quite high values. Going in the reverse direction, you know, you've got uh, a value between zero and this value, so you haven't got as much scope for manipulating the concentrations in the reverse direction. So that reflects itself in the IV curve. In this direction, you can keep increasing the concentrations at the edge, so you get this exponential increase. In the reverse direction, you, you run out of scope. You can't reduce the concentrations below zero. So you um, run into a saturation of um, the flow in that direction. And then when you um, shine the light on the device, you just get the additional excitation superimposed upon that, and the whole curve just physically moves down as indicated here. Um, so that's one of the key features of analyzing photovoltaic devices. Particularly in the next lecture, I'm gonna give a couple of features that are sort of second order features that not everyone in photovoltaics is aware of that allow you to um, understand what's happening in the devices a little bit more easily than trying to analyze the fundamental equations or whatever. But superposition is one idea. The, the light and the dark characteristics can be superimposed to work out what's happening in an illuminated device. So voltage is sort of a dark type of parameter you apply to the device, figure out what's happening in the dark with a voltage, figure out what's happening in the light with one particular voltage, whatever's the easiest to work with, and then superimpose the two to find the final device characteristics. Okay, so I'll finish up this first phase and then we'll take a 10 minute break.
and uh, remember, you have to have a couple of questions when I finish. Um, we enter the modern era. So this is the, um, you know, we, in the storyline, whoops, we'd got to the stage where um, this type of cell design had been developed. And this is just an array, you know, using those cells. So, you know, for a decade or more, the, the same type of technology was used in all spacecraft. So this is um, Skylab that went up in the early 70s and there was a big program to standardize on the cell design for that spacecraft. So that really solidified the design of the space cell. A lot of testing done for the cells for that, um, that spacecraft, which is in the Aero Space Museum in Washington. Uh, quite an interesting exhibit there. Um, but uh, technically, um, the dev devices had a problem in that in order to keep the series resistance of the devices low they used to, and to make it easy to make contact to this um, N-type region, they didn't want it too thin. They wanted something substantial to actually be able to physically contact. So they used to pump a lot of phosphorus into the surface. So um, this shows the phosphorus concentration as a function of position within the material, so very high at the surface, generally introduced by thermally diffusing it in. So you have a, a gradient of phosphorus in the material high at the surface then low. Um, silicon only can only accept a certain amount of phosphorus in a substitutional position. So the phosphorus actually replaces the silicon at the atom sites, but you can only do that for a certain amount of phosphorus without, um, without um, getting so much strain that it no longer can occur. So you get a saturation in the electrically active, the useful phosphorus, as indicated here, if you try and pump too much in, as they were doing in these devices. So you had a region in the surface where the phosphorus was not substitutional, but it managed to get incorporate the silicon in some other way. Um, you know, silicon phosphide precipitates, things like this, but other than the ways you wanted. So you had this uh, dead zone at the surface that corresponded to that flat region that is shown there where the, there was more phosphorus in the surface than could be usefully used. So, um, you know, after a decade of sticking with this structure, you know, meanwhile, over this period, there'd been fantastic steps forwards in microelectronics. So the 50s saw the development of bipolar transistors and so on. Uh, but the 60s saw the, the, the first interest in integrated circuits and so on. So that um, uh, the 60s was really a rapid stage of development of the technology to make integrated circuits and the photographic techniques to get very fine features and so on. So in the, in the 70s, um, a group at uh, one of the space cell labs had a look at um, how they could refine the cell design based on, um, on the developments that occurred over the last decade. And uh, they came up with a cell that's known as the violet cell and it was first reported in 1972. So they, they realised what was going on with this heavy diffusion, not a real good idea. So they, they made much lighter diffusions to, um, to reduce the, the, um, the damage done by the excess phosphorus. Essentially, they uh, instead of sticking with the six fingers per two centimetres, they, they decided, well, we've got all these photographic techniques from microelectronics, we'll define the fingers using photographic techniques, and they went from six to 12 or even 18. So um, big step forward there. Um, and then um, because, the, um, because the cells with the improved uh, diffusion here could respond better to blue light, they redesigned the anti-reflection coating so, they ref so that the reflection was better for the blue lights. The blue lights, so they made the refle anti-reflection coatings designed for shorter wavelengths because the cell was more responsive there. So that gave the cells the, the violet colour that, and uh, hence their name. So um, light phosphorus diffusion, photolithically defined top contacts, so much finger, finer fingers. Um, the other thing they did, they, they realised that this rear metal interface wasn't a really good idea. So the, the interface between a metal and a semiconductor is generally a, a region of very high recombination. So you have to protect the uh, minority carriers from that region. So they realised if they made that region a heavily doped p-type, like just remembering to what I said before, push the whole concentration up, it pushes the concentration of electrons down. So it's like, um, you know, I used to give an um, analogy between a, a plumbing analogy like pipe diameter. This is a large diameter pipe here. There's lots of electrons 
um, concentration in this material here. Here is very low electron concentration, so it's like a small diameter pipe. So this restricts the flow of electrons to this rear contact. So by having this heavily doped region, you can restrict the influence of the detrimental influence of this rear contact. Um, yeah, a higher index, less absorbing anti-reflection coating. And um, be because in, in these space cells, a, a fairly lightly doped substrate was used, like um, the, the damage that you get from radiation in space, it's a little bit like um, uh, something that occurs in terrestrial cells that I might talk about later. But um, it depends upon the number of boron atoms that you have in the, in the base, the amount of damage you get. The fewer borons, the less damage you get in, in the space environment, the less defects that are created in the, in the silicon because the defects are boron impurity related. So um, because these devices were responding more to the blue wavelengths, it didn't matter so much that uh, you had to protect this um, you had to uh, prevent the, the damage in the, in the base region. You could tolerate more damage in the base region without, with the same type of cell overall degradation because the blue was quite resistant to the space radiation damage. So you could go to a higher doped substrate. So it went from 10 ohm centimetre to 2 ohm centimetre. And all those things gave a massive jump in improvement. Whoops. Well, they gave a slight, <laughs> a slight improvement as shown here. They took the... The, the, well, the best space cells were about 13% efficient. This other result here is, is an N-type wafer, which differed from the, the P-type wafers at times. So you got a, you know, a reasonable jump from this point here to this point by all those refinements. And just a couple of years later came the black cell. And um, again, it was another technique that was borrowed from microelectronics, but people had become interested in selective etches. So there was a number of microelectronic devices that relied on angling the silicon geometry by attacking the crystal planes in the silicon at different rates. And um, uh, it's the same group that developed the Barlet cell a couple of years later came up with the black cell and it, int it introduced the pyramidal texturing that all monocrystalline commercial cells use today. Um, and uh, so that was the black cell. So this is a quite an interesting graph. It shows the current versus voltage curves for the conventional cells. So this, these, this is under space radiation, so the efficiencies are not quite the same as are shown here. But um, this is a conventional cell, low current output due to the, due to the um, poor emitter region due to the heavy um, doping with phosphorus, and a low voltage output due to the, the low resistivity of the substrate and the lack of a back surface field or anything to protect you from this rear metal contact. So, um, you know, and that's the type of technology that have prevailed throughout most of the 60s. Then the violet cell um, bumped up the current by improving the, the top surface region, reducing the shading losses and things, and then also improved the voltage by using a higher doping in this region and protecting the device from the rear contact recombination. And then the black cell capped it all off by reducing the reflection from this top surface and giving you an extra boost in the current. Uh, this just shows the spectral response, the response to different wavelengths of light showing the corresponding jumps. So this blue region, that corresponds to light that's absorbed close to the surface. The high energy photons get absorbed quickly and the old space cells weren't very good at converting those. Violet cell overcame that, came that limitation and then the black cell did even better. Um, and at the long wavelengths, this back surface field region prevented recombination of photogenerated carriers in this region, increasing the spectral response there. So uh, improvement in both current and voltage, and that gave a um, big jump in the cell performance. So, and, that, and that got people interested also in, you know, just how far could you go with performance? We have got this big jump by doing these you know, this re-evaluation of cell design, you know, how far can you go in, um, in cell performance? So that was the situation in the early 70s where the group here was started. The technology had evolved to, you know, reasonably respectable efficiencies so around 17% um, or 18% under current measurement conditions. But, um, uh, but there was a lot of excitement about, you know, just what were the limits on performance and how far could you go? Um, 
So the next lecture will take the story up from then, but I'd like to have a question or two if there's any out there before we take a break for about 10 minutes. Any questions? Well, I don't really have that one, but <laughs> sure there's none. Yes. Um, so one of the issues uh, is that the variable between solar energy and food. Mm. Um, so uh, at what point do you think, I guess, like the theoretical efficiency of solar cells, um, what point do you think they will reach? Um, and also how will that, I guess, balance the whole variability issue as well um, in terms of forecasting? Yes. Yeah, so the, you know, the, the main development up to this stage in the history of the cells was for space use. So that's an example of a different spectrum. They used a spectrum that you know, hasn't got the absorption bands and everything you get in the terrestrial spectrum and a lot more blue. So they had different design criteria from, um, from standard cells. But um, you know, in principle, there's no reason that you have to be more spectrally sensitive as you go to higher and higher efficiency. So that I, I think ultimately you can maintain a device, you can design a device that has similar, um, uh, that can have much higher performance than present devices, but still maintain a similar <coughs> tolerance of spectral variations. So I'll talk a little bit about it more at the end of the second lecture, just where things might be going in that direction. But um, yeah, probably um, the, the, the spectral changes aren't, uh, you know, aren't, aren't really an inhibiting factor in high performance design, I don't think. Okay, if there's no more questions, you're welcome to come up during the break, but um, we'll start again um, you know, just after um, one and with the second part of the lecture. Thanks for your attention.